You're listening to The World at Eight with Lynn Mozart. <laughs> Nationalist News. Highlights of the news today, Friday the 15th of June. Bank of England to fight Eurozone threat with £100 billion. TB death girl symptoms ignored for five months. Euro news with Nick Griffin, MEP. Egyptian court dissolves Parliament. Tensions in Tunisia rise as curfew is imposed. Germany bans Islamist group Militu Ibrahim. Thought for the day, freedoms? What freedoms? Finally, don't break down in London. UK News. British Bank of England unveils £100 billion to fight Eurozone threat. The Guardian's business blog reports that the Bank of England is to pump £100 billion of their emergency cash into the economy. This will include £80 billion in funding for lending schemes. This money is earmarked for non-financial companies. It is thought that the banks will lend this money to households and small businesses, But as the rules that relate to the bank's lending will not change, that is, they bear the brunt of non-repayments, this doesn't look likely to make any difference to first-time buyers or small businesses. A teenager who died from TB, Alina Sarag, had her illness undiagnosed for nearly five months, her father Sultan said. Her symptoms were so bad her GP, Dr Sharad Pandit, who runs Highgate Medical Centre in Birmingham and had been Alina's GP since birth, thought she had cancer. This was despite the fact that the 15-year-old Alina had tested positive for tuberculosis following an outbreak at her school in 2009. After receiving antibiotics, the disease was found to be latent. But when she returned from holiday in Pakistan in August 2010, she fell ill. She passed away at Birmingham Children's Hospital in January 2011 after suffering a cardiac arrest. An inquest into Alina's death has now recorded a verdict of death by natural causes. Her father called Dr Pandit more than 50 times for help and Dr Pandit has told the inquest that he fully accepts that a diagnosis of TB never crossed his mind. All, and there were many, healthcare officials involved ignored the previous diagnosis and treatment of TB and put her illness down to chest infections, viral infections, meningitis and bulimia. One so-called specialist even said it was in her heart she was lovesick and advised her to see a spiritual healer. An NHS review said that many opportunities had been missed to identify her TB, but the inquiry by the Heart of Birmingham Primary Care Trust found that no individuals involved in her case had made major mistakes. It concluded that there was a need for greater awareness of the disease and its dangers across the medical profession. The court was told that in 2011 there were 402 cases of tuberculosis in Birmingham. A World Date reporter commented, These foreign doctors should be used to dealing with TB. It is endemic in their countries, and now it has come over here. To have TB diagnosed in a school situation in a large city in the UK is very serious. So is the fact that many Pakistani immigrants travel back and forth between countries unchecked and spread these diseases? Alina's death is awful and one must wonder how certain health care officials sleep at night. We have already had a rabies scare from two Indian nationals, so what has gone on that the British public do not know about? I give you the European news from the belly of the beast with Nick Griffin. It's not every week that I get to have a go at two baronesses, but this has been a good one, and I have. First, there was the thoroughly modern conservative expenses treat, Baroness Wazi. You may know that I made an official complaint against her under the Theft Act over her grubby accommodation claims. I pointed out in particular that her ludicrous excuse, namely that it wasn't dishonest to take money to which she wasn't entitled because she gave it to someone else, in itself provides prima facie evidence for a case against her. Unfortunately, but all too predictably, the Metropolitan Police took only a few days to announce that they will not be investigating David Cameron's top token Muslim. But if they think they can brush this little affair under the carpet that easily, they can think again. First, Simon Darby has now lodged a Freedom of Information Act request for all the documents and meeting minutes arising from the deliberations on whether to prosecute or not. In all probability, this has already led to someone having to spend hours rooting through files, shredding paper and deleting emails. They'll probably cover their tracks, 
but there's always a risk in doing so, because if something slips through, what could have been excused as a poor but honest decision can be exposed as corruption and malfeasance in public office. In any case, Wazi can rest uneasy in the knowledge that we're still digging. This isn't just a matter of potential criminal liability. We're also now examining the possibility of a complaint to the solicitor's regulatory authority because, as a solicitor, the good baroness should know better than to bring her profession into disrepute by being caught out stuffing even someone else's pockets with ill-gotten cash. Then, in order to purge from my mind the image of the lovely Saida in her Tory blue sari, I switch my attention to the even lovelier Labour Baroness Cathy Ashton. Those teeth! That nose! That voice! Sometimes I have to pinch myself to remember that she's running the European Union's foreign policy rather than in the 330 sweepstake at Epsom. As the EU's High Representative, Baroness Ashton was the main figure in a debate on the EU strategy for Afghanistan. The main plenary chamber in Strasbourg this week was as empty as it ever it is, but I was pleased that speaker after speaker questioned her absurdly rosy and sickeningly self-congratulatory tone about this. Erwald Stadler, MEP for the staunchly nationalist BZO, the League for the Future of Austria, slammed the waste and futility of the neocon adventure in Afghanistan. I have a lot of time for Herr Stadler. He recently provided me with a stunning dossier of information about the situation in Austria, which will form a chapter in the book I'm writing about the ultra-Zionist drive to take over and harness European nationalism to the cause of the creation of an Arab-free Greater Israel. I do not, incidentally, think the extremists will succeed, not least because so many decent Jews in both Israel and the West abhor their intrigues, corruption and warmongering. The warmongering Baroness was also forced to listen to me, expressing the British nationalist opposition to the neocons' Afghan folly. I won't repeat what I said during my one-minute ration of free speech and democracy, as you'll be able to see my speech on BNP TV, but you can bet your life that being lectured, albeit briefly, by me, isn't Cathy's idea of a good time. So many thanks to all of you who, in some way or another, helped to send me to Strasbourg to add a British voice to the common-sense nationalist minority. I'll have some good news for you soon about our work in the Alliance of European National Movements, so I hope you'll tune in next week. Until then, remember that freedom isn't free, but everyone can do something to secure it for the future. And keep the faith. World News. Egyptian Court Dissolves Parliament. Egypt's Supreme Constitutional Court invalidated the recent Egyptian parliamentary elections. The court is allowing the presidential elections to go ahead with army-backed candidate Ahmed Shafiq to remain in the presidential race. The Muslim Brotherhood-led parliament was swift to condemn the move, which highlights the tensions remaining in Egypt between the army, the courts and the Muslim Brotherhood-led parliament. Tension remains in Tunisia as curfews imposed. Tunisian authorities have banned protests by rival Islamist groups and imposed a curfew in response to this week's violence. The current round of unrest grew out of the Salafist riots over a recent art exhibition. The Salafists are strict fundamentalist Muslims who believe in a literal and strict Islam as it was first practiced 1,400 years ago. Germany bans Islamist group Militu Ibrahim. Militu Ibrahim, a strict Salafist organization, was banned by German Interior Minister Hans Peter Friedrich as authorities carried out a nationwide crackdown Thursday. The interior minister took action after the Salafist organisation continued calls for Muslims to fight against Germany's constitutional order. A German security official said Militu Ibrahim taught followers to reject German law and follow Islamic Sharia law and told them that the unbelievers are the enemy. Thought for the day. Our freedom? What freedom? Our freedoms. This defamation bill is a disaster for free speech. So writes Brendan O'Neill in his political blog. Now, we might not agree with Brendan in all things, but he makes one very salient point that will be used to attack anyone on the wrong side of right speak. The bill, for all the good it will do, has at least one major glaring and worrying fault, the abolition of a jury's decision. The decision will be placed in the hands of the state. A single state-appointed judge will be the sole arbiter of responsible journalism. When it comes to a body of a few men listening to everyone and everything, as cited in the new Communications and Data Bill, which I will touch on later, but they cannot spare 12 good men and true for a court case. Something is very, very wrong, my friends. Juries can be got at, as we know, from the trial in Blackpool of our Muslim pals, but one man is even more got-atable, excuse the English. 
We have had the trial by jury for hundreds of years, and we should not change for the European machine of one judge or even three of them. Twelve men or women, none connected and none related, hopefully, is the norm over here. The British government, our government, is due to announce legislation which will lead to a huge expansion of surveillance powers of communications on the internet and mobile phones in the United Kingdom. It is called the Communications and Data Bill and will allow the police and security services to keep track of who is calling whom on mobile phones, the email addresses of all correspondents and the personal IDs of people chatting on social networking sites. Now, in my humble opinion, that is what the Leveson Inquiry was set up to do. Create such a fuss and bother over what has been going on for the government and state for years in the hush-hush sector and pillory poor old Murdoch, a well-known Republican and ultra-conservative, albeit a very manipulative and ambitious one. The powers that be do not want any single private person having sway over the media and press. It will be too dangerous in the future to have alternate views brought before the great British public alias the chattering classes as they are fondly referred to. The Leveson forerunner, because that is what it is, dealt with a few minor celebs and even more minor politicians being bugged. I thought this was par for the course. They have been bugging British National Party people for years. I believe it is very odd to hold a very expensive inquiry over bugging a private persona's phones when the government is preparing a new communications and data bill which is set to do exactly the same but on a national basis. As it is, this inquiry has held the public's attention away from what is really going to happen, that is, the muzzling of the press and the drastic alteration to the court system, all far more important than someone being upset over what some rag has gleaned from their pathetic mobile phones. No warrant would be required for these surveillance operations, which would need to be authorised by a senior officer, and the Home Secretary would have to issue a warrant to access the content of communications, since there simply aren't enough magistrates to provide judicial oversight. Now, I doubt whether these newfound powers will stop disgusting websites like Hobo Hotel and the rampant techie paedophilia that it contains, or the online groomers with their underage customers. Oh no, that makes money, and money rules. The government will get information, and knowledge is power. Will they use this to prevent terrorism? Doubt it. Will they use it to halt the coming of Allah? Doubt it. Will they use it to make life easier and cheaper for many of us? Doubt it. Will they use it to keep our green land literally our green land? Doubt it. In fact, these proposals are nothing short of draconian. Big Brother was for 1984. Well, it is a little late, I grant you, but 2012 is here. Roll on the Mayan calendar. You do not need it. As for mobiles and communications being open to eavesdroppers, well, they always have been up to a point, but making that point legal, when there is a huge expensive inquiry at the moment to chew over just that fact, is bordering on the ridiculous. Labour failed to give us Big Brother, but the Libcon coalition is destroying our civil liberties. And finally, anti-terror police blow up tourists' broke-down car outside Parliament. It was reported in the Telegraph that a business student from Wales, Nima Hosseini Raisi, was visiting London when his Ford Mondeo broke down in Storey's Gate next to the House of Commons. Leaving a note on his car that the AA would soon attend, he decided to visit Buckingham Palace. On his return, he found Metropolitan Police picking through the remains of his car. A Scotland Yard spokesman said, We can confirm there was a suspect vehicle at Storey's Gate at 10.20am on Wednesday and a controlled explosion took place and the incident was subsequently deemed as none suspicious. A World Date reporter commented, Whatever you do, do not break down near the House of Commons. The trouble with this particular case is that in future, if a genuine terrorist leaves a car near the Commons, the police will probably leave it for fear of being deemed racist. And kaboom! We will have got rid of one of the main problems with the UK today. You have been listening to The World at Eight. I am Lynn Mozart, and I and the team at Radio Britain wish you all a very happy and safe weekend.